Buenos dias. Buenos dias. I want to talk about the next 25 years in technology. There are three trends that I think are very, very important. You probably have heard of these names, but I want to explain to them a little bit more detail in a way that you may not have heard before. The first one is a term I call cognifying, to make things smarter. We also know it as artificial intelligence. The problem is, is that we don't know what our own intelligence is. We have a misidea about it. We think of it as a single dimension called IQ, where it, like sound, it gets louder as we go along from the first little bit in a mouse to a little bit more in a chimpanzee to maybe an average person to maybe a genius. This is wrong. This is a wrong idea. Our own intelligence is much more like a symphony, a basket, a complex, an ecosystem of many different types of thinking, many different types of cognition, from perception to emotional intelligence to deductive reasoning. There are maybe 12 or more different types of cognition in our own minds, and they, of course, vary person by person. And when we make and look at animals, we understand that they also have different kinds of thinking. In some cases, they may be even be greater than our own. Okay? And when we make synthetic machine intelligences, we're also going to make them in a, in a way that they will at times have more intelligences in certain dimensions than humans do. Okay? And so the important thing I want to take away is that there are many different types of minds, many different types of thinking, and that when we make them with machines, we're going to make a whole zoo of different species of intelligences and smartness. And we will engineer them for different purposes. And the way to think about these is almost as if they were alien intelligences, different kinds of thinking. And thinking different is actually the engine of the new economy. And these things will help us think differently. The second important thing to understand about artificial intelligence is that it's going to launch a second industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution came about because we invented artificial power. Water power, steam power, oil power, electrical power. Before then, everything we had to do, we had to use muscles, natural, human, or animal power. Everything we make from a road to a house had to be using this natural power. When we invented artificial power, it allowed us to create things like this building, all our clothes, our automobiles, houses. Everything came because we had this new power that we could employ. And we distributed that power on a grid of electricity that went to everybody in everyone's home. And it became a commodity. It became a utility, something we expected. And if you wanted po artificial power, you bought as much as you wanted. And that was an inspiration for entrepreneurs around the world. So someone like a farmer could imagine taking a manually natural power water pump, and it says, oh, I have an idea. What if I took that manual pump and I bought some electricity and I could make an electric pump? And that electric pump could run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if we take that innovation and multiply it by a million times, that was the Industrial Revolution. Now we're going to do the same thing again. We're going to take that electric pump and we're going to add some artificial intelligence, and we're going to make the smart pump. And the smart pump will run, and it will adjust itself, and it will be smart about how much water it's using. And we'll take that innovation, and we'll multiply it by a million times. And that's going to be the second industrial revolution brought about by the fact that we have taken things that we have formerly automated, and now we're going to make them smarter. We're going to cognify them. 
Okay? So when you drive your car down the street, you are harnessing 250 horses, the equivalent of, of the natural power of 250 horses that are underneath the hood and are driving down the road. And now we're going to add 250 minds to that 250 horses. They're not human minds. They're a different type of thinking. But that is the auto-driven car. That's the Tesla. That's the Google auto-driven robot car. And this intelligence, these, these artificial minds, like electricity, is going to be available on a grid that we call the cloud. And it becomes a commodity, a utility that's available to everybody. So anybody here in this audience right now can log into the internet, the cloud, and you can buy some AI. You can buy some artificial intelligence yourself, which you can use today. And it will become increasingly easier to use. We're making more and more tools so that you can use this AI as an individual, as a company, as a country. So that suggests to me that the formula for the next 10,000 startups is very, very simple, which is to take something and add AI to it. Just as in the past, we took something and we automated it. Now everything that we have automated, we're going to cognify. And this idea is central to some of the biggest companies in the world. A company like Google, which was seeing the phone as its center, is now saying, no, AI is now the center. It's, it's, it's the first thing that we think of. And I want to emphasize that this, like the Industrial Revolution, will touch everything in our lives, including things like agriculture. So AI and agriculture is you have this robot that can go down the field and it can recognize each individual plant one by one and remember what it needs in terms of fertilizer or water. So it has individual customized treatment to each plant in a million plants on a field. That's how AI can even impact things like agriculture. So this AI is going to produce more new things for us to do than it will take tasks away. We're going to work with these machines rather than against them. So the challenge, the opportunity that you have is to imagine what you would do with a thousand minds. These minds are not human minds. They are artificial smartness. But what would you do with a thousand minds working for you day and night? That is the opportunity that you have in the coming decades. The second trend I want to talk about is called interacting. We keep making our devices, our things, our technologies, and we demand that we interact with them more and more. And the ultimate way that we can interact with our computers, with our devices, is to actually go inside them. And we call that virtual reality. Where you put on a pair of goggles and you're in another world. You're inside the computer. And that impression, that sensation is really does work. You really feel like you're somewhere else. And I'll explain why in a second. But there are two kinds of VR today. There is the immersion kind, the kind I talked about, where you put on a dark pair of goggles and you're in a different place. And then there's a kind that produces presence, which is really a pair of magic clear glasses that you put on. And so you still see the room, but there are these virtual things that are in the room that you can walk around and you can play with and move and manipulate, but they are just virtual. They're not real. And that advantage is, is, is to people who are designing new products. They can move things around. Um, it's a great way to learn because some people learn best using their arms and their hands and their body. And Microsoft envisions the future of the office as these magic goggles that you put on and you can have as many screens as you want in front of you which you can read very, very clearly, and you can manipulate and use your fingers as a mouse. Most people, I believe, are going to encounter virtual reality first in this form of the mixed MR or augmented reality. That is technically more difficult to do, so it's going to be longer in coming, but it's going to be the way that most people encounter it mostly at work first before it comes into their home. So that mixed reality of 
moving with your arms, manipulating things, having multiple screens. What you get out of all this is, is a new currency called experience, okay? Because when you take off the goggles, when you take off the glasses, what you remember is not having seen something, but having experienced something. Because the experience of VR works on a different part of your brain than the brain that reads a screen. It's a very different experience than seeing something on a screen. And that experience is what becomes the new currency. And it's what, or what you're going to trade, what you're going to sell. So we now have a, an internet of information, but we're going to be moving to an internet of experiences. And that will be what you share with your friends. That will be the thing that you have when you go into uh, an environment that humans can't go to or it's very expensive to see or too dangerous. And those experiences are vital because they're part of this new economy based around experiences. For a long time, it's been known that there's a kind of a ladder of value and that if you start at the bottom, you're just selling a commodity, like, say, the example would be coffee beans. And then if you want to add value, you begin to sell the goods, the processed coffee. And if you want to add even more value, you make it into a service. Instead of selling coffee, you sell the coffee service like a Starbucks. But the ultimate way to add value and in, to increase your price is to turn it into an experience where you actually have customers go back to the coffee plantation and experience the whole story of coffee. And what's interesting is that overall for almost 150 years, the real costs of commodities and goods have gone down, 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 down on average, while the exception has been experiences which have been increasing in price. So they are the one of the few things becoming more valuable over time. So the virtual reality world is going to play into this idea where we're creating experiences which are becoming the most valuable thing that we have. And that's why I think we're going to see this become a new platform. And the most important, most interesting um, experiences we have in virtual reality are not these amazing worlds and not being able to have a virtual object, but encountering other people. And so this is an example of some avatars. They're not even photorealistic, but they capture the body language of that person. They have the voice of that person and they have eye contact. And that's enough to make you feel as if that person's there. You know they're not there, but you feel as if they are. So that's why I think that virtual realities are going to become the most social of all the social media that we have. And it's, they will become the next platform after the smartphones. The opportunity that we have is in making experiences. And so what kind of experiences can you make? How can you imagine new experiences? And that's this, what this technology will let us do. The third trend that I want to talk about is sharing. You've heard about a sharing economy, but I want to expand this idea of sharing to incorporate the idea that we're going to collaborate in a new way. I don't care what business you're in, whether it's in retailing, uh, whether it's hoteling, whether it's agriculture, fashion, you're now in the data business. It's all about the flows of data. And data about your customers are actually sometimes more valuable than even your customers themselves. And I'll give you one quick example, which is Ford has manufactured 100 million vehicles in its history. It's worth approximately $40 billion US. Tesla is a very young company, has only made 186,000 vehicles. It's worth more than Ford. Why is that? That is because they have data. Ford has almost no information about how its customers actually drive their cars. They don't even have the names and addresses of a lot of their own customers. But Tesla has all that information and has a billion miles of how people actually use and drive their vehicles in great detail. They're basically a data company, and they're being valued because they have that data about their customers. We're just at the beginning of what we're going to do with that kind of information. And my expectation is, is that 
we're going to be able to collaborate and cooperate at a scale never seen before on this planet. Facebook itself has two billion customers. And imagine what you could do with two billion customers who are online together at the same time other than just sharing gossip. So we have a new machine that we've made at the size of the globe. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a computer the size of this planet. It has one trillion transistors. If you take all the things that are connected, all the phones, all the laptops together, it is a very large machine. And that is the new machine that we're going to be programming. So the question and the opportunity people have is, what could you do with a million people cooperating and collaborating together in real time? That is the new opportunity in the next couple decades. I want to just close uh, talking about the future very, very briefly. I really be believe that we're at the first day, maybe even the first hour of the first day of what's coming, of all the great stuff that's coming. We're at the beginning. And if we imagine ourselves as uh, looking back from 25 years from now, 2050, looking back now, we would realize that everything started right about now. That all the, good all the biggest changes in our lives in the next 25 years are beginning right now. So that when we look to the past, we would realize that this is actually, we, we have the best tools now that we've ever had. We have the largest markets than we've ever had. We have the cheapest money to, to borrow. We have the lowest barriers to entry for doing and making something. And if we look to the future, if we say, here's where we're going, and we're looking back, we realize that right now there are no experts. There, there are no AI experts. There's no virtual reality experts. There are a lot of people working up, but compared to what we will know, we don't know anything. There's very low-hanging fruit, all the easy things to do. There's very little, relatively, no competition now compared to what there'll be in 30 years. And it's the cheap entry to start all these things right now. So from the perspective of the future and from the perspective of the past, this is the best time ever to do something. Right now, this is it. You have the great opportunity to be in 2017 at that moment in history that is the best time to do something. And the last thing that I want to remind you is, is that the greatest products in 25 years from now are probably not even the ones that I mentioned because they haven't been invented yet. If I gave this talk 25 years ago, I would not have mentioned the web or smartphones because none of them had been invented. So AI is coming, virtual reality is coming, but there's probably other things that are even bigger opportunities than what I've just mentioned. So we right now, you right now, are in a great position, the best time in history to make something, the best things that will come have not yet been invented, which means that you are not late. You're not late. This is the time to do something. Thank you for your attention.